what event can you think of immediately that has changed the world? Just think of something that has happened in history past that changed the world. 9-11, COVID, Holocaust. Israel becoming a nation. All right, well, I guess I don't need to speak because you... <laughs> Noah's flood is an event that changed the world. None of us, I don't think, were there for the flood. It was Noah, his wife, and three boys and their wives. But that was a, a life-changing event, a world-changing event. Mount Tambora Volcano. Have you ever heard of Mount Tambora Volcano? There are other ones that are more famous than that, but this was the one that was the most devastating. Not only did it kill, I think, 60,000 people in Indonesia, but because of all the volcanic ash, for the next year, it, you talk about climate change, it, there, were, there was snow in the summertime in places, and crops failed because of the 1815 volcano. Uh, we can think about World War II, we can think about the September 11 attacks, we can think about the 2020 coronavirus and how that changed our lives. Some of these things were mentioned. But events that changed the world, how about a guy on a camel? A guy on a camel. Coming from Ur of the Chaldees across the Fertile Crescent. The Lord said to Abram, this is Genesis 12, go forth from your country, your relatives, your father's house, to the land which I will show you. He didn't put a coordinate in his GPS. God didn't hand him a road map. He said, get on your camel, I'll tell you when you've arrived. And I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. Make your name great, you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. We usually quote it, and I will curse those who curse you, but look in your Bible, and unless it's Holman, which is a great translation in most places, but it has the plural there. Most every translation has it as the Hebrew does in the singular. The one, God pays attention to the singular anti-Semite. The one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's why in verse three, this is considered the hinge pin of human history. Not the three most important verses in the Bible, but everything from Bereshit bara Elohim at the Shemaim v'etaretz, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, through the end of Genesis 11 is prologue. Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham's lineage, wife Sarai, nephew Lot, and we get to these verses and God gives a global promise, not just the personal promise of blessing to Abram, but in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And everything from verse four on is a fulfillment because in verse four, Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Abram went forth and the world changed. Didn't know it at the time, but it did. Genesis 15 is where God cuts a covenant. In fact, it says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Doesn't say Abram covenanted with the Lord or, or even that Abram and the Lord covenanted together. It says the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And as you read the story, you see only God passes between the sacrificed pieces, obligating only himself to the land covenant. So it's a special place. The land of Israel is God's land. It is the land of promise. And then another event that changed the world, this is the Exodus. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. Genesis 15, God says to Abram, know for certain that your descendants are gonna go down to a land not their own, and that they're gonna be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And here we see in Exodus 12, after 430 years, to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Why can we be certain that the prophetic future is going to unfold as God says in his word? As we were reminded last night, because in the past, what God said was going to happen has happened. The same God who fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament scriptures that have been fulfilled will be faithful to complete them. And this is a seminal event nine times in the Torah. God identifies himself to the Jewish people. I, the Lord your God, am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
At Passover every year, Jewish people, whether in Israel or scattered in the nations around the world, are reminded of this event that changed history. Just to highlight a couple of the points in more modern Israel's history, 1917 was the Balfour Declaration. Uh, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. And this was after William Blackstone, the founder of Chicago Hebrew Mission, which became American Messianic Fellowship, the ministry that Lori and I joined back in 1975, and today is known as Life and Messiah. Um, Our founder was the author of the Blackstone Memorial, which was given not only to President Benjamin Harrison here in the United States, but to the heads of state, including the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, asking for favor to be shown to the Russian Jewish people who were undergoing the pogroms in the late 1800s. How many of you have seen Fiddler on the Roof? Who hasn't seen Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, that's your assignment for this afternoon. (laughs) No, really, Fiddler on the Roof, it's not just a great musical, but it really gives insight into uh, the suffering of the Jewish people. And, uh, you know, Tevye, the milkman, at one point is... Uh, undergoing a lot of tzuras, a lot of suffering in his life. And he lifts his head to heaven and he says, God, if this is what it means to be chosen, why don't you choose somebody else for a while, right? So you go back to Genesis 12, 3, where God says, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then you look at that litany, that history of suffering and persecution. Jewish history is written in blood and in tears, right? And to me, this underscores the reality of the truth that whatever God especially loves, Satan especially hates. There's no way that you can explain the length and depth and breadth of anti-Semitism if you don't understand the spiritual roots of why the enemy wants to destroy the Jewish people. In San Remo Conference in 1920, Britain was granted the mandate, which included, as you can see, Transjordan as well as uh, what was then Palestine. But in 1921, Britain unilaterally sliced off everything east of the Jordan and the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, today known as as Jordan, it was Transjordan initially, was just unilaterally given to uh, King Hussein's family, which was basically an Arab tribe. And the stuff on the left side, the west of the Jordan, was partitioned by the UN in 1947. An event that changed the world, May 14, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion stood in an office in Tel Aviv and announced the formation of the modern state of Israel. It hasn't happened in history that a people have been kicked out of their land for thousands of years and returned and reestablished a kingdom and reestablished a language that hadn't been spoken. 1949, the War of Independence ends and the armistice lines are as you see here. It was not a peace treaty. It was not an agreement of the parties that were at war that they were gonna live in peace. They just laid down their arms. And then after the 67 war, the land that was occupied by Israel, this is the Six Day War. It was in June of 1967 that Israel conquered the land of, uh, well, the Sinai Peninsula, which more than doubled their uh, geographic space, the Golan Heights, of course, and the West Bank, what we refer to as uh, the West Bank, uh, Samaria and the Sharon. Here's the 1981 annex of the Golan Heights. So when you look at a map of Israel now, the Golan is included in Israel proper. Uh, United Nations hasn't recognized that, but the United States did in 2019. Lori and I were living in Jerusalem in 1982 when Israel gave the Sinai back to Egypt. And a formal peace agreement was signed with with Egypt. And uh, remember the nightly news being filled with pictures of Israeli citizens up on the roofs of these houses. Yemit was a beautiful development town in uh, in Gaza. And when uh, the Jewish people were evacuating. Uh, They actually had to bring in police force to get people off the roof. And somebody asked, why are you you resisting your own government in leaving? And they said, because we want everybody to know that trading land for peace never works. 
and we don't ever want to do this again. Israel gave the Sinai back in, in 82. So here's the boundaries today. The population of Gaza in 1950 was 63,000. Today it's over 750,000 and projected to be over a million in another decade. Uh, the population on the West Bank, uh, there are over 3 million people there, including the Jewish citizens. 490,000 West Bank Jewish settlers, and then another 330,000 living in East Jerusalem. If you're an anti-Semite, there's so much that you cannot use that has been invented by the Jewish people, right? That, that flash drive, those little jump drives, thumb drives. Um, ICQ was the first uh, messenger service. You have texting on your phone? That was invented by Israeli teenagers, ICQ. How about Waze? I drove here with Waze on this morning. Uh, gets me all over the world. It's an Israeli tech. For billions of dollars, they sold that to, uh, to Google. Uh, some of the medical breakthroughs. You know, less than one half of 1% of the world's population has won more than 15% of the Nobel Prizes. And in medicine, it's more than 30%. When God said he was going to bless the world through the Jewish people, in many, many ways, um, they have been a blessing to us. But of course, the reason we're here today is because of the spiritual blessing. That's what God had in mind. Um, it wasn't Barbara Streisand and Adam Sandler that, that God had in mind, or the Marx Brothers. Um, it, as much as a blessing that they may be to you, it's the scriptures and the Messiah himself. Israel's conflicts were shown up on that first video. Uh, in every decade, Israel has had armed conflict, and even in the news this summer, uh, you've seen pictures, images of uh, Israelis in conflict and the ongoing uh, situation with the Palestinians. One of the greatest inventions for Israel's defense has been the Iron Dome, which has been done in concert with the United States. Billions of dollars have gone into developing this technology. And, you know, these rockets, $70,000 to knock down a, a missile that might cost a couple thousand dollars to, to make. Uh, but Israel is committed to protecting their citizenry. The wizardry that's involved in this, if the algorithm shows that the rocket's going to land in a field, they don't send the Iron Dome. If it's going to target a civilian area, then the rockets go up. And 90 to 96% success rate in knocking down these things. And because of the expense, uh, they're also now working on uh, lasers. So for just a few cents, uh, when that technology is perfected, they'll be able to uh, defeat rockets. And how important is that, given the neighborhood in which they live? Hezbollah has been being armed by Iran for a long time, and the number of missiles that they have is almost incalculable. So understanding amazing Israel, we can celebrate, we can wrap ourselves in his, his, the Israeli flag and sing Hatikva, um, but I don't think that's what God calls us to do as believers. He calls us to be like the men of Issachar, who understand the times and know what to do. That's what we as committed Christians who believe the word of God need to be doing. Israel's population growth from 1950, there was about 1.2 million people, now over 9 million. It's true now that uh, more than half of the world's Jewish population lives in Israel. If you look at the growth rate, however, uh, the peak was back in 1965 at 4.57% annual growth rate. It's down to 1.5 right now. That includes uh, birth rates and it includes people who make aliyah. Jewish people who come uh, to become citizens. Israel's economic growth, uh, back in 1950, the GDP was 2.89 billion, and it's up to 522 billion today. You can see the real jump started in 1995, and then the growth curve there. And the per capita income went from 1,300 to 54,000 since. 1960. Israel's governments, we could spend a lot of time reviewing this in detail, but I just want to highlight 
Israel's George Washington is David Ben-Gurion. He was head of the provisional government from May of 48 when he declared Israel to be uh, established as a state until the first Knesset took place in 1949. Think about this. The Jewish people who had immigrated from so many countries, so many different cultures and languages, are now responsible for putting together a government. I don't know why. It's always been a matter of curiosity to me why they chose a parliamentary system, because the British mandate was uh, in place from about 1922 until 1947, 48, is when they became a separate state. Israel adopted a parliamentary system, which was what the Brits had. And it's kind of a cockamamie system, if you ask me. Uh, and as you see how convoluted Israel's politics have gotten, especially in recent years, uh, you know what I'm saying. Moshe Sharet served only nine months, and Ben-Gurion came back in for another four terms, from 55 until 1963. Levi Eshkol is an interesting uh, prime minister. He's the only one in all of the elections that Israel has had since 1949 He's the only one who had a plurality in his own party. The alignment party had 63 seats by themselves, and you need 61 to form a government. So Golda Meir, uh, I understand there's a movie about Golda that's out in the theaters. Has anybody seen that, Golda? Only one? I, I'm looking forward to seeing that. She was from America. She lived up in Minneapolis, I believe. Uh, Milwaukee, sorry. Begins with M. It's north. <laughs> It's north, Mayor, Milwaukee. Um, so she served three terms. And then Menachem Begin was the prime minister when Lori and I lived in Israel. I actually got to hear him speak live twice, once up at Tel Highway up in the north and once in Jerusalem. Uh, and then Bibi Netanyahu is known to all of us. His first term of service was from 96 to 99. And then he was out of office until uh, 2009. And you can see... He's in his sixth term now. He's the longest serving of all of Israel's prime ministers. Recent elections, you know there have been five elections in two years in Israel. Three years. Five elections in three years. And the reason for that is because Israel is so divided politically. Um, so we can talk about the left wing and the right wing. Actually, there are many parallels that you can draw between what we're experiencing in the United States with the political divide, the increasing divide, and the increasing animosity, even hatred, of one party for another or individuals therein. So the party on the left uh, wanted term limits for prime minister, especially after Bibi kept repeating. They wanted to pro prohibit indicted individuals from being able to be candidates because Bibi's been under indictment, never tried nor convicted. Um, you see the parallels in the United States? They wanted compulsory voting. They wanted to make it a law that everybody had to vote uh, so they could get more people uh, on their side. They wanted to have a two-year state budget. One of the reasons that Israeli governments can fall is if the Knesset does not pass the budget, then the, the government automatically dissolves. So they said, well, we, uh, we ought to have a two-year budget, so at least we could have a government in place for two years. Uh, that's the thing with the parliament, is on any day, somebody can stand up and call for a vote uh, for the dissolution of, of the government. Uh, investigate Netanyahu's culpability for the Maroon deaths. If you follow Israel's news, you know about uh, the trampling of the ultra-Orthodox during the uh, celebration in the spring of 21, and also the handling of COVID. Some of the same criticisms that are uh, launched against the US, liberal against conservative, and vice versa. But there is another factor that makes Israel's politics so intense. And that is the disproportionate amount of influence because of the parliamentary system of the, of the religious. See, Ben-Gurion was secular. Most of the founding fathers were from a socialist background in Europe. And so Israel adopted a lot of socialist ideals. That's where we get the kibbutzim from. 
Uh, but but Ben Gurion made room for the religious. He was not religious himself, but he respected uh, the right and the importance of of religious Jewish people uh, to have influence in the state. So some of the laws that have been written are favorable to the ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox, uh, and some of the folks who are on the secular side of things bitterly resent some of these benefits. Compulsory military conscription for male ultra-Orthodox Jews is something that the left wants, that the right has protected. Uh, increased secular studies in ultra-Orthodox Jewish schools. Uh, there's concern that the kids who are growing up in religious schools are not getting a broad enough education. Uh, in, in general history, in mathematics, in science, uh, the basic reading, writing, and arithmetic uh, that kids in religious schools may not have advantage of. And also, in the last administration before this one, they passed a law that it was no longer necessary to study Torah in the public schools, which the new administration has reversed, allowing local authorities to decide on the closure of businesses on Shabbat. Well, whose who's ox is being gored here, right? Um, saying that the secular authorities can decide what the religious leaders up till now have had the ability to do. And another huge one is this idea of civil marriage. Yeah, if you're an Israeli and you're not religious and you want to get married, you have to be married by a rabbi or you have to leave the country. You go to Cyprus or wherever you want and you can be married in a civil marriage. But there is no such thing as civil marriage in Israel. You can't go to a justice of the peace or you know, somebody who's licensed to perform weddings. And the other side of that is only the rabbis can grant a divorce, which has been a huge issue uh, in the religious community. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about, um, including the support for the LGBTQ agenda. So the 36th government, this is the one before the present one. If you look at all the parties that are in yellow. This is the coalition that was cobbled together to get a 61-seat majority. It was a weak government. It was, um, there were actually two prime ministers. <laughs> you know, Bibi Netanyahu is the consummate politician. I don't know of anybody who is more wily in politics than Bibi. Uh, he's, he's amazing in, in the machinations that he pulls off. So he has made agreements with others that he would share uh, the prime ministership to get them into his coalition, but then he dissolved the government before it was time for them to serve, which is why so many of the people who have worked with Bibi before say never again, right? <laughs> so if you look at this, and it included the last party is Ram, which is, which is an Arab party. For the first time in Israel's history, an Arab a party was included in the ruling coalition. And it only lasted uh, from June of 21 till December of 22, uh, when they had the last elections. And then came Bibi once again, the return of Bibi. And his Likud party has 32 seats by themselves, by far and away the largest, but to get to 62 or 61 from 32, you've got to double your numbers. And he did it but look at the three parties that he made a coalition with. All of these are the religious parties. And some of them are further right. I would say Likud and Bibi himself would be a, a right center politician. Uh, but many in his coalition are much further to the right than he. And, and because if they leave the coalition, you take any one of these parties, 14 seats, 11 seats, 7 seats, away from 64, and you don't have 61 anymore. So what that means is that anyone, any leader of Betzalel Smotrich, Arya Derry, Itzhak Goldnop, any one of them on any day can walk into Bibi's office and say, if you don't give me this, I'm pulling out of the coalition and the government, the government goes down again. So uh, we need to be praying for Israel. Israel is beset with problems externally, but the internal issues are huge as well. If you're paying attention at all to Israel, sometimes it's hard to know an event that changes the world uh, when it happens. You know, 9-11, you know, you saw that. Uh, we had two weeks, 
two weeks to flatten the curve for COVID, right? So COVID kind of crept up on us and then became a big thing. Uh, but when you get thousands, tens of thousands of people marching in the streets of Israel, we haven't seen this before, have not seen this before. A plan to change Israel's DNA. 80,000 rally in Tel Aviv against judicial overhaul. Against judicial overhaul. What, what, what are you talking about? What, what's the big deal? Judicial overhaul. And you can tell the Times of Israel, you can tell what their perspective is, their bias. Braving rain, opponents of coalitions, radical proposals, protest, protest at Habima Square, minor scuffles with cops near the Ayalon Highway. The president is urged to declare Netanyahu unfit to serve. Right? These guys are serious about bringing Bibi down and Bibi ran on a platform that said, we need reform of the judicial system in Israel. And we'll talk about why in just a minute. So here, 80,000 rally in Tel Aviv and big headlines with numbers. Look at the next one. At Tel Aviv protest, Ehud Barak calls for nonviolent civil disobedience. This is a former prime minister of Israel who's calling the citizenry. He has participated in uh, a government with Bibi in the past. He's from the Labor Party, which is not a natural ally of Likud, but he's been part of, he was the prime minister himself. This is like having a, a former president of the United States calling people to go out in the streets and, and rebel against the, the government, right? Why are you laughing? <laughs> <clears throat> and here's the other side. This is Reuters now. Israelis backing Netanyahu block highway and counter protest, right? Now we're at thousands of Israelis. Before it's 80,000 who are against Netanyahu. The press very much is supportive of the left. Where does that happen ever? And the nation demands legal reform chanted some of the demonstrators carrying Israeli blue and white national flags. So Bibi said, we need to reform the judicial system. If you vote for me, we're going to do it. He got in, he formed a coalition, and he said, okay, now it's time to reform the judicial system. So what's the, what's the big issue with the Supreme Court? Well, how justices are chosen is one issue, and the reasonableness clause is the other. And I'm going to have to fly through this because I can't stop the clock. But you can go to uh, the Knesset website, and you'll find the same material that I'm giving here. We talk about SCOTUS here, the Supreme Court of the United States. In Israel, it's Bagatz. This is the Beit Mishpat Gaboa Litzedek. This is Israel's Supreme Court. They're selected by a committee, and seven of the nine committee members have to vote for Supreme Court members, and appointed by Israel's president. Thank you for the wave in the back. Uh, appointed by Israel's president, not the prime minister, right? So the president of Israel is a more of a figurehead. He represents the state might be similar in some ways to like the king of England uh, with ceremonial responsibilities in England, but not having real political power. So when you see the word president in Israel, don't think about the person who's holding the power. That's the prime minister, typically. All right, here she is. This is Esther Hayut. She's been the Supreme Court president of Israel since 2017. Okay, this would be uh, the equivalent of the chief justice of the Supreme Court in the United States. And according to the, the basic laws that were founded when Israel became a state, uh, a judge shall be appointed by the president according with the selection of the committee. Don't have time to do all this in detail. I just want you to see that the purple, there are five members of this committee who are from the legal profession and for the most part are going to be represented by the liberal left. And then there are four ruling coalition appointees so these are people that Bibi can say, I want to have on the committee, right? But it's five to four. Now, when you're selecting a Supreme Court uh, justice, you, you have to have seven votes. But the Minister of Justice shall be the chairman of the committee. Do you see that at the bottom? The Minister of, of Justice. Well, that's not the Supreme Court president. And it's not the Attorney General. It's the Minister of Justice. You've got a president of the Supreme Court, you got an attorney general, and you have a minister of justice. 
and they're all vying for, for power. And the only one that Bibi put in place is the minister of justice. Yariv Levine is a smart guy. He, he's been in the government before. He's been a member of Knesset. He served. He's a deputy prime minister. This guy is brilliant. And he is arm wrestling to the max with the liberals who don't want to have um, things changed. The, <laughs> I can't go into detail because of time. But if, you, if you're interested in this stuff, now is a great time to be tuned in to Israeli news sources uh, because the struggle is titanic. And at this point, it's not certain who's going to win, right? Bibi's been try, trying to reach some kind of a compromise, but the folks who are on his right in his coalition say, no, we're not backing off. And the people who are over on the left say, well, it's the end of democracy if you change the system. Uh, but the system is rigged, and it's not in the favor of the right. So the attorney general now has told the Supreme Court, Levine, who is the justice minister who's in charge of calling this committee together to appoint all the judges, not just the Supreme Court judges. You can't be a judge in Israel without being appointed by this committee, of which he's the head. And he's saying, you know what? We're not even going to convene the committee to appoint any judges until we get these laws changed that need to be changed. There's this guy, Tuberville, have you heard of him? Who in our Congress is saying, we're not going to pass any budget until you make the changes that need to be changed. This is high stakes football here. All right, we got to go quick. Supreme Court jurisdiction. You notice this line, save religious courts. The Supreme Court has jurisdiction over everything except the religious courts. The religious courts are the Beit Din. This is what the rabbis rule over, right? So you've got right in Israel's bylaws that um, the rabbis can do their own thing. To grant orders to religious courts to deal with a certain matter on the basis of their jurisdiction or to avoid... So this says, okay, you guys can do your own thing, except at the time when we don't agree with what you're doing. The secular law can say, right? So this, this is like the agunot, these, uh, the women who want a divorce and their husband won't grant them the divorce, right? And if the rabbis aren't going to put pressure on the guy to grant the divorce, you know, then maybe the secular government's going to tell the rabbis what they have to do. Do you, you see the kind of tension that's building here? Uh, the ultra-Orthodox population is getting to be bigger and bigger because they're the ones who are having multiple children, right? The secular Israelis, their birth rate is hardly going to replace the population. So everybody knows what's going to happen in the future is Israel is going to become what they call blacker and blacker, the black and white garb of the ultra-Orthodox. Now the reasonableness clause. The reasonableness clause. So here's the background. Israel was governed by foreign laws for centuries. The Ottoman Empire had its own set of laws. Then the British Mandate was there from 22 to 47 when they set up the Knesset, it's unicameral. There's only one house in the Knesset. We have, we're used to the Senate and the House of Representatives. So there's no real check and balance internally. Israel doesn't have a constitution. This is one of the basic reasons why we're doing all this heavy duty arm wrestling. You know, there's not blood in the streets yet, but I won't be surprised if we get there because there's no constitution. People will refer to it's not constitutional, but there's no constitution. There are basic laws. The Supreme Court does not require standing. You can't, nobody can just go to Washington and make a case before the Supreme Court. It's an appellate court, you've got to go through a whole system. But in Israel, anybody can appeal to the Supreme Court. There's also a basic shift that started in 1992 when this human dignity and liberty, liberal, liberty law, um, which was designed to protect the rights of the minorities. But Aharon Barak, who is the Supreme Court president from 95 to 06, was a very activist judge. And we know there are strict conservatives in our Supreme Court who say, what does the text say? And there are others on the other side who say, well, who, who do we want to become, right? So the activists on our Supreme Court, when they're in the majority, have moved us in directions that we as conservatives are not comfortable with. And you have the same thing that happened in Israel, uh, specifically under um, Aharon Barak's rule. 
And he's the one who introduced the idea of extreme unreasonableness. Can you imagine this? That the Supreme Court of the United States could look at a piece of legislation that the United States government has passed, our legislature, and say, well, we don't think that's reasonable. And so it's not a law. That's the way it is in Israel today. This is why Bibi says we've got to have some changes. Those on the liberal side say it's one of the few legal tools available to the court to check arbitrary and capricious governments, and that it counters corruption. You know, if we get a corrupt guy like Bibi, we've got to be able to do something about that. And the others on the conservative side say it's a highly subjective tool, absolutely. What's reasonable to one person may not be reasonable to another. And it's crossing the boundaries of different authorities. And again, because we don't have a clear constitution that defines some of these things. There's a wonderful quote here um, that I don't have time for, um, but Simcha Rothman on September 12th, that's this last week, um, gave an impassioned speech before the Supreme Court about why you guys have to deal with this issue. It's not right for a few people. He calls it, uh, quoting Moshe Landau, who was a former uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice, uh, no remedy will be found in the control of an oligarchic regime by a group of people, no matter how wise and prudent and honest they may be. You can't have just a couple of people um, who can overturn the will of the people. So he says this is crossing a red line, and uh, Rothman said, public trust in the court is waning. Politics is dirty business. You can see some of the reasons uh, here on the screen. And foreign money is pouring in on both sides. Democracy is under siege. <laughs> Let's riot. So Israel's social fabric is being torn as never before. As in America, civil disagreements are turning into enmity. The Supreme Court will deliberate on the, reasonable on the reasonableness of the reasonable bill. This is, it's like something out of Alice in Wonderland. Israel's enemies are taking note. That's the sad thing. So Howard Bass is a pastor in Beersheba, a good friend, uh, and he wrote a, published a, a blog in which he says, I agree with the need for some judicial reform. Right? If the Knesset required a three-fifths or two-thirds majority to overrule and overrule by the Supreme Court, that would remove nearly all the politically self-serving power plays. And he makes the point that this call for judicial reform and that democracy is at stake is really an attempt on the left to um, subvert the election. So we need to be praying. Howard says, neither side is righteous, and that's true. We would say the same in American politics, would we not? It's not like we have a righteous party and an unrighteous party. Uh, each has its own slant or bias and prejudice. But he also says, neither side are friends of the Messianics, right? Uh, the, the, secular, the secular liberals uh, want to preserve more of the human rights, the LGBTQ and other oppressed minorities, and there was some hope that uh, there would be some benefit to believers if the liberals were in charge, but then you get all the other stuff that is morally impure. Only God is righteous and judges righteousness, righteously. Society is free to live in peace. All right, external threats. We were reminded last night, keep your eye on the Middle East and these unfolding coalitions, right? These alignments. It was shocking to me this, just this summer when Saudi Arabia went up to Iran. Saudi Arabia and Iran have been at loggerheads, and Israel has been making overtures towards Saudi Arabia as part of the Abraham Accords. All right, so our response, be informed. So I flashed through uh, resources. If you, if you want to know some good places to get news out of Israel, so our response, number one, be informed and be prayerful. Right, Isaiah 62, 1 and 6 and 7, these are verses that um, are dear to our hearts. You who profess the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem an object of praise. Be bold in sharing Messiah. We have that up here? 
Well, we would. There it is. Be bold in sharing Messiah. Because you talk about events that change the world. How about this one? He is not here. He's risen. Right? That's the message that we proclaim. The Jewish people need to know that Messiah has come. Paul says that he's not ashamed of the gospel. To the Jew first, especially. Uh, and then wish your Jewish friend a happy new year. There it is. Apples and honey, right? What would it look like if our Jewish neighbors saw Christians as the ones who are going to stand against anti-Semitism, who are going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, who seek their good and their blessing and their benefit? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are the guardian of the people of Israel. And yes, Jewish history has been written in blood and in tears, and there's more yet to come as we understand the scriptures. And our hearts grieve for those who are suffering today and who will suffer. We pray for those who are in charge in the government in Israel, that you would give real wisdom. We pray that you would send a spirit of reconciliation. But most of all, Lord, we pray for a convicting work of your spirit to draw people to the Savior. Remove the veil that's over their eyes when the scriptures are read that they might behold the glory of the risen Messiah, in whose name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.